Good morning, Westside. I must say, whether you were here at Lenexa or at Speedway or online, you look marvelous today. Perhaps better than you've ever looked. <laughs> I'm Brian Phipps, one of the pastors here at Westside. I put a blindfold on this morning because I had an experience right before Christmas that was really cool. We had the Father-Daughter Summit here at Westside, and during that time, we were asked to go on a faith walk, and a faith walk is when you put a blindfold on, you're asked to walk all across the campus, only guided by the voice prompts of your teenage daughter. <laughs> That's scary. Gave me a brand new appreciation for two things. One, folks who have lost their sight. That is a very difficult thing. And two, gave me a significant gratitude for the sight that I have. Fun thing that Jesus does with this thing called sight teaches us an awful lot about who he is. We've been talking about light all morning. We're going to continue to do that. We're in a series now called Knowing Jesus, not just knowing about Jesus. And we're going to find out that this idea of light helps us really bridge that gap between our heads and our hearts when we, instead of knowing about Jesus, knowing him intimately. Grab your note sheet, if you will. Wave it to me. Let me know you have it. Thank you for that. And fill in the first blank there. It's the big idea, the whole series. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. It just is different. We're going to see that powerfully this morning. Jesus, in the few verses we're going to look at here in the Gospel of John, talks about himself as light. And you can't just know about light. You kind of have to know it. And here's why. If you don't know how light works, I'm going to give you a little bit of the science behind it. When it's dark, you can't see because there's no light. What happens when light comes in? Light is electromagnetic waves that our eyes are able to interpret. They take those rays, they interpret them into nervous impulses somehow, and then that sends it back to the brain, and the brain interprets what's going on out here. Thankfully, the light's on so I can see all of you highly beautiful people. The pleasure for me. Well, when that's not working, when there's no light, I can't see. And what Jesus says is that he is light and that we need him to be able to see. Now, that raises a question for any that are uh, knowing what's going on in this world, and that is this. What in the world can Jesus help us see that light can't on its own? Great question. This whole idea of sight and light actually uh, helps us continue to understand that question uh, in illustrative form. If you're familiar with the electromagnetic waves, which are light, you recognize that our eyes are only able to pick up a sliver of what's there. On one side of the spectrum are ultraviolet rays, and our eyes can't pick those up. Other instruments can, but our eyes can't. There's a part of reality that we can't see. On the other side of the spectrum are what? Who's the smart science people in here? There's a few of you smart people. Infrared lights and waves are on the other side, and our eyes can't pick those up either. Other instruments can. Our eyes cannot. So there's a lot to our reality that our eyes can't see. Jesus says the same thing. He says, there's a spiritual reality that's very present. It's all around you. Your eyes can't see it without me. You need me in order to do that. In fact, he had a very frank conversation with a man named Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus is a brilliant teacher of the Bible and stuff back in Jesus' day. And he comes to Jesus and he says, dude, you got to help me see something. He didn't say it in those words, but he's pretty much saying that. You need to help me see what's up with you. There's something different about you. Fill us in. What's going on? Jesus looks him square in the eye and says this. It's in John 3, 3. I tell you truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot see. See the words there? He cannot see the kingdom of God. It's there, but you can't see it unless you're born again. Born again, what's that mean? He goes on to explain a little bit later that that means born of the Spirit. Unless you have that spiritual insight, that spiritual life inside of you, which Jesus, by the way, says that he brings, you're not going to be able to see this stuff. Today's big idea, would you write it in the blank, is this. I need Jesus to see everything that I need to see. There's a lot of stuff in this spiritual world that you can't see, that we can't see. He says, 
you need me to see it. But there's another part of this that I want to bring to your attention. It comes out of my experience in walking with Jesus. Maybe some of you have experienced this. You ever had that time, you know, you're committed to walking with Jesus and allowing your path to be illuminated kind of by who he is and, and stuff, but had that moment where the light just kind of stopped coming? Uh, you get to that place where you, you've, you've, Jesus has led you about this far, and then it seems like he doesn't show you a next step for a while, kind of in a dark place and not exactly sure where to go. I've had that moment on many occasions where you get to that place and you're just looking around, you're not sure what to do. Sometimes what Jesus is saying is that's still everything you need right now. We're going to talk about what that's like. Some of you get that. And if you get that and you're in that spot, I hope that today will be another encouragement for you to hold on because we'll find out what God's up to in those times. Some of you are, they get that, but you're, but you're not experiencing that right now. Say, go God, thank you, I love you for not being in that spot right now. Perhaps today is a reminder for you so that you can encourage someone else. Others of you may not get exactly what we're talking about at all yet. What do you mean? I've never been in that spot. How, does, how do we see what Jesus, hold on, I'm gonna share a story from my own experience today that I hope will help you see what Jesus is getting at here. There's a powerful prayer in the book of Ephesians, the beginning. Paul, the guy who wrote this book, offers this prayer, and it goes like this. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. Pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope. Would you please underline those two words? The confident hope he has given to those he has called. What do we do in those times when we can't quite see any further about what to do? Paul's prayer is that he would flood your heart with, with light so that you can see. Some of you know that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, comes right out of this verse. I want to pray this for you before we go any further. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are here this morning to not simply know about you, but to know you more intimately. You say that we need you to see everything. Help us to see. Flood our hearts with your light so that we can understand and have that confident hope that you died for us to have. In your name we pray. Amen. Fill in the first blank, if you will, and that's this. Jesus is the life light. Jesus is the life light. Why two words there, Brian? Why not just one word? As we look in John chapter 1, verse 4, the first of our two verses today, I think you'll understand. It says this, in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. In him was life, and that life was was the light. In other words, his life, the things that he lived, the things that he did, the things that he said are the light for us. But not just those things, also his life itself inside of us through his spirit sheds light on where we're to go in this life. Huge thing. Big detail we don't want to miss out on here. That word life is a very special word. There's two words in the Bible in the original languages that kind of just are used for this word life, translated to life. One's bios, bios, that's just like we get the word biology, stuff that's alive, you got blood beating through there. And then the other is zoe. And if you've been through our Get Charged class, you're familiar with this word, we use it a lot. This is the supernatural God life that Jesus brought. This is that spirit-filled life, that life that understands the things of the spirit that don't make sense to everyone else. Jesus says, I'm bringing that stuff into the world, and that stuff is the light. It's that stuff that helps you to see. There's a couple of things I know about this Zoe life that I want to pass along to you. One, God says this, everything in your life, good or bad, will be used by God ultimately for your good if you let him. That's a pretty cool gig. I like that. He also says about this Zoe life, it'll always have purpose. It'll always have meaning. It'll always have peace. It'll always have joy. And it will always persevere. Who wants a little bit of that? 
Yeah, I want that. In fact, you might be thinking, Brian, is that, is that a little bit too good to be true? I mean, is that real? Is that really available? Absolutely it's available. I have a number of friends, many friends across America, across the world even, who have experienced this Zoe life. But let me say this. Jesus does say that narrow is the gate, or small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to what? This life. And few find it. Doesn't say it's not available for those who seek it. Those who seek it will find it. But he says it's hard to find. Why? Write this in your blank, if you will. Because Christ's life often goes against our enlightenment. Jesus' life often goes against our enlightenment. Listen, if you were to do the highlight reels of Jesus' life, you would find very little footage that would fit the Hollywood feel-good movie show. Right? I mean, so much of Jesus' life is, is backwards based upon what we understand in our own default ways of living. Jesus says, you want to have power? You want to be in the lead? Yeah, I want to have power and be in the lead. He says, we'll serve everybody. Huh? He says, you want to have life and have it to the full? Absolutely, I want to be fully alive. We'll give everything you have away. Give your life away. Don't make it about you. Huh? You want to get a lot? Yeah, I'd love to get a lot. We'll give it all away. Jesus, that just doesn't make sense. That was his life. Read it. All four of Gospels demonstrate this guy who, who gave everything away. In fact, his life in many points was fairly miserable. Enlightenment. Why that word? Why am I using that word? One, I love the word play. Jesus is saying, I am light, and in the 18th century, mankind decided that they didn't want God's light anymore, and they wanted to start to figure out life on their own. And here's what happened in the 18th century. You know this if you've had Western Civ before. They started to look at everything that was God and go, we're tired of the tyranny of this, this uh, religious oppression. We're going to start to figure things out on our own. Does this sound like an eight-year-old or what? Absolutely it does. So they, ha they took logic and scientific method and started to elevate these things above anything else they'd seen before. And they started to measure life and predict life and to kind of get it all in a box. And quite honestly, there's some great things that have come out of this movement. I'm so glad it took place. For that reason, we've got medicine. We can understand a lot of things. All that's great. But the problem is this. All of us have taken this scientific method and use it as the grid by which we view our lives. We default to this mode. And there's two major problems with this mode. Scientific method says this. I'm going to evaluate and I'm going to measure everything in order to determine what's true. Problem is we can't see it all. Logic says get it all on the table and we'll plot it all together and we'll come to a deduction about reality. Well, Jesus says you can't see it all. You don't have all the pieces. If you're frustrated, this is why. Jesus says, I am the missing piece there that you need in order to be able to see those next steps. That's why it's so key to me that Jesus be the light that shows us the way we got to know him, not just know about him. Now, I'll be honest with you, this takes an awful lot of trust in somebody that we can't physically see. I get that. Fortunately for me, I had messed my life up enough that I didn't trust myself driving. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, enough. Some of you haven't messed up enough to really trust Jesus. Oh, when, you, when you've wrecked the car 15 times, then you kind of let him drive. I just made a decision at one point in my life to let him drive and to let him have that process. Now, if you don't have a history with him, particularly as Jesus leads you into the dark and doesn't necessarily give you a next step right away, it's going to be hard to be trusted. It's going to be hard to trust him in that. So what I want to do is share a story from the Chronicles of the Phipps household to fill you in on kind of how God works in these situations. I was a, a pastor, a associate pastor in Central Florida right out of seminary. And man, I was excited to get into ministry. And for two years, that was the best job. I loved it. Central Florida, fishing, great people, all that stuff. But it wasn't too long into that that I started to realize God gave me dreams 
about ministry that were bigger than the position there that I had. And so I started sensing God was going to lead me out of that position into a lead position, pastor, or lead pastor position. And so I was open to that. And there was a church about 15 miles away in frostproof Florida. They only had about 35 people, but they were 35 of Florida's wealthiest people. And they wanted me. And they had a great package. And all they wanted me to do was marry them and bury them and preach to them once a week, basically spiritually anesthetize them until they died. It was kind of what they wanted. It was a sweet deal, man. <laughs> it was just a sweet deal. A lot of money, a house that was paid for, and the house was right across the street from a lake. It was a three-car garage. I could have parked my boat that I could have afforded in that point and had the sweetest life. But that's not what God wanted. Fortunately, he gave me enough insight to not follow what my eyes saw, but to follow his. So I waited. Another opportunity similar to that came up, turned it down. And then God said, I want you to go up to Rock Hill, South Carolina. There's a church up there that needs you that's about what you're about. It's, they're going to carry out some of the same stuff that you've been passionate about. And it was so much less money. <laughs> but I didn't care. I'm going to follow Jesus in that because I know that's where he wants. I don't care. It's not about the money. I'm trying to do this whole give my life away thing. You know what I'm talking about? I'm just trying to, trying to follow Jesus and be light. But here's the math that I had. If I'm willing to make a sacrifice like that, if I'm willing to not take what is worldly and stuff that I want, then God's going to honor me. He's going to take care of me. That's what we think. That's what we think. It's true. But watch this. This is nuts. I was thinking, man, God's going to sell my house. I'm going to make some money on this thing. I'm some money on this thing. God's going to take care of me. Didn't sell the thing for nine months. And that was before the crash, man. That's when things were going up. I lost all of my savings trying to not go in the red, all of it. And I don't know if you've ever been in a position like this, but my position like that found me driving one home, going home one night after a meeting, and I was so mad at God, I punched the ceiling of my car. It hurt. And uh, <laughs> I was like, how could you treat me like this? I'm one of your good guys. Did you not see what I did? I could have taken that job and I'd be fishing right now, but no. <laughs> I was really, really mad. Tears coming down my eyes. I know that God uses those times to shape me. I know God uses those times to make me into a better guy, but I honestly could not understand how he could use that amount of stupid stuff to make me better. And I told him so. This is where a lot of you quit. This is where a lot of us quit. And we say, God, if you're not going to make sense to me, I'm done with you. A lot of you are there right now. Let me tell you something. This is where it's so helpful to not just know about Jesus, but to know him. Because he knows what that feels like. Picture it. Here's Jesus who had heaven, not just central Florida. They're close, but they're not the same. Easy now. All right. He had heaven, and he came down here to love me and to love you and to honor us. And he came faithfully, and he did what his father said. And then the people that he came to love started to betray him, started to reject him, started to abandon him, finally beat him, put him up on a cross. It's foolishness for him to persist. Why did he do it? How in the world could that guy continue to be faithful? It's because he knows this piece right here out of 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Makes no sense if you don't have that Zoe, if you don't have that life, if you don't have Jesus guiding you. Even if you have Jesus guiding you, it doesn't make all that much sense at some point. But to us who are being saved, you ready? For those of us, God is changing from the inside out. It is the very power of God. It's the very power of God. Whoa, that doesn't feel like power from God to me. Well, he's doing the biggest surgery in your soul he's ever done up to this point, and that power works. How did Jesus know it? How do I know it? How do many of you know it? Because light always wins. 
Light always wins. Look at the next verse. It's verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Listen, I get up every morning, usually earlier than Carol, and I don't want to turn on a lamp or anything to, to mess her up. And so all I do is just turn on my cell phone. Light, or the room is filled with darkness, but one little bitty piece of light wins and I can see my way. Write it in there in that blank. Light always wins. Light always wins. There's no circumstance in where darkness out extinguishes light. It never happens. Picture Joseph, if you will, in the Old Testament. If you know Joseph's story, that dude was at it bad. He gets all these dreams of what God's going to do to use his, use his life. And then his brothers sell him down into slavery. He sticks it forward, keeps going with Christ, keeps letting God light his path. And he honors him. And then he throws him in prison because some broad just messes him over, <laughs> goes into prison, you know, and he's, he could say, God, I quit. But he didn't. He persevered. And God raised him up. And he made him king over all of Egypt practically. Saved all of his people from a drought. He knows that it's the power of God working in his life and that light always wins. That's how he persevered. Jesus the same way. How in the world could the guy keep going forward with all that he had to go with if he didn't know that on the other side of the cross was a resurrection power that would give us life? Light will always win. Back to my little car episode. I don't want to leave you hanging without the rest of the story. It's a pretty crazy story, quite honestly. I got to two places, two points in that period of time where my money ran out before the month did. Um, you ever had that time where you had to write checks, stick them in the envelope and stamp it, but leave them on the desk because you couldn't send them in yet? I was there two different times. And at that point, I was so distraught with God. It was hard to teach. It was hard to lead. I just, I was having trouble figuring him out. I said, I love you, but I don't get you. Those two different times, and I'm telling you the truth, someone would call me and say, Brian, I need to come by your office and speak with you for a minute. Now, normally when that happens, I think I'm in trouble. What did I do to offend somebody or whatnot? <laughs> Not the case. They came in and said, I don't know why I'm here except for the fact God asked me to come in here and give you some money. And both times it was just enough money to pay the bills that were on my desk. That's crazy. I don't get it. Now you might be saying that that's coincidence. That's fine. Watch this. My house in Florida finally sells. Break even on it. We start to look for our next housing arrangements. Thank goodness, because what we were in was a dump. The pastor, previous pastor of the church that I was a part of, calls me and says, Brian, that's kind of what he sounded like. <laughs> nice guy, just didn't sound all that nice. He said, Brian, I wish he would be online right now. That'd be so cool. Dr. Mitchell, <laughs> if you're here. I didn't mean that, really. <laughs> anyway. Listen to what he says. He says, Brian, my wife and I are getting ready to move into a retirement home. We want to sell you our home. But here's the deal. We want to tithe the sale of the home, take 10% of that sale, and give it to you as a down payment for the house. It came within $150 of what I had lost in my savings. You're not getting that yet, are you? You're doing the math. I don't think that's coincidence. I don't think that's coincidence at all. I think that's God saying, Phipps, you trusted me. You trusted me in some little man sizes. Yeah, you made some good calls. You did the right thing. I'm going to take you places that you won't trust me to follow you into until I show you that I can ridiculously come through. Okay? And he did. And then four years later, you know what he asked me to do? He asked me to give up my 20 years of networking and relationships that I'd built in a denomination and follow some crazy cat out of Texas and plant a church in Charlotte. You know that guy. <laughs> Dan Sutherland. Sutherland said, I got $50,000 raised at this church that I can help you plant a church. As soon as he said that, my denomination said, I got 200. Peek, 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 
spooky. But the light of Christ said, go into the unknown with me and see what I'll do. I'd watched him provide in a crazy way before, trusted him again, went and planted a church five of the best years of my life. And that was the step God used to prepare me to come and be with you. I don't know how he writes stories, but I've given up trying to write my own. Let him write a story in your life. Light always, always wins. I'm guessing that you have been thinking of a kind of a dark place in your own life, not exactly sure what to do in any given situation. I want us to experience what Jesus is trying to say to us. I want to take Jesus off of paper and put him into life for a minute. We're going to turn the lights off in just a sec. If you've got little ones, snug them close, okay? But we're going to experience what this is like. Go ahead, cut the lights. The book of Genesis says that in the beginning, darkness hovered all the earth and it was chaotic. Some of you are experiencing that chaos right now. You can choose to continue to try to figure it all out on your own. You can use all the logic in the world you want. If Dr. Phil, he'd ask you, how's that working out for you? <laughs> but Jesus would say something different. He would just simply ask you if he can come into your life and start to guide you along the way. He's asking you right now if you will hand him over the authority of your life and allow him to lead you. I promise you, I promise you, he promises you that he will never leave you alone that he will always guide you and that you will never be in darkness again. You can ask him in. But we don't have to stop with just the light that's in us through Christ. Jesus tells us that he is in others around us as well. He invites us to be a part of things like life groups and life studies and lifelines so that, my goodness, this is a lot more light. I don't need just this. I mean, if I'm using my own little light, I can see a little bit in front of me, but it doesn't light up everything. But when I have other people in my life who love me, who care for me, and who have Jesus in them and have the insights that they've had with Christ, that's just that much more light that lights my way. And we have these opportunities for you to engage in here. You don't have to walk this thing alone. But it gets even bigger than that. You've got a whole church that just loves life groups and life studies and lifelines. We bleed this stuff. We want everyone to win. We want everyone to have an absolute abundance of life. And so this church pours into groups, helps groups win, helps them understand those dynamics so that more and more, wow, light comes in to your path so that you can see in front of you how you need to go. These are all friends of mine that are part of groups that I'm a part of. They speak into my life. I speak into their life. We're all better because we're working this thing out together. And when this happens, friends, when you've got groups that are just filled, we got uh, j just make up the whole church, what happens is this, the prayer that we asked earlier, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those that he's called starts to take place. I urge you, I beseech you, do not walk in darkness. Jesus is the light of life. Get as much Jesus as you can 
and walk in him forever. There are folks out in the comments. This is our group launch time, and there's folks out there ready to help you discover a life group or a life study or a lifeline. All the information about what those three things are is in your bulletin or online. Go check it out and sign up for one of those environments this week. If you don't know where to go, we'll tell you what that first opportunity is. Get Connected is a 90-minute experience that Pastor Dan and I lead. We want you to come because it's there. We'll start to show you where you go next. Walk in the light, my friends. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.